Good morning to you. Um, how are you? Doing okay? <laughs> Hot? <laughs> no, you're not. The air, the air conditioning is going. It's only 73 degrees in here. We go through this at home. I'm sorry. That was my wife. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To see the face of God in many languages is a link between seeing and understanding. In English, we say things like, as you can see, when we mean, as you can understand. We say that people have great insight or that they are blind to the truth. In language and in thought, there's a deep connection between seeing and knowing. This past Tuesday, we celebrated great, the great feast that focuses on human beings actually seeing God. At our Lord's transfiguration on Mount Tabor, he reveals his hidden identity to Peter, James, and John. His face shines like the sun and his clothes become dazzling white. Moses and Elijah appear with him, but they're dead. No, they're not. Until a cloud overshadows them and the voice of the Father proclaims, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. The disciples understandably fall to the ground before this overwhelming and surprising revelation. You and I have, would, would have fallen to the ground in fear too if we had seen this. But the Savior tells them to rise, have no fear. And they see only the Lord himself. What happened on the mountain? I ran across this story. Christian author Paul David Tripp tells this story about a trip to Washington, D.C. He says, I remember taking my youngest son to one of the national art galleries in Washington, D.C. If you've ever been there, you know how spectacular and large this, the, the Washington Mall is and how many uh, museums there are. As we made our approach, I was so excited about what we were going to see. He was decidedly unexcited, but I just knew that once we were inside, he would have his mind blown and would thank me for what I had done for him that day. As it turned out, his mind wasn't blown. It wasn't even activated. I saw things of such stunning beauty that brought me to the edge of tears. He yawned, he moaned, he complained his way through gallery after gallery. With every new gallery, I was enthralled, but each time we walked into a new art space, he begged me to leave. He was surrounded by glory, but he saw none of it. He stood in the middle, middle of wonders, but he was bored out of his mind. His eyes worked well, but his heart was stone blind. He saw everything, but he saw nothing. That's the end of that. At first, we may think that the change that occurs at the transfiguration is in Christ's appearance, but it's actually a change in the spiritual eyes of these three disciples. The Lord enables them to behold his un unchanging, eternal, uncreated, divine glory to the extent that they're able in order to help them develop in their spiritual understanding and to prepare them for his passions, his passion, as the hymns of the feast tell us so that they would know that as God, his suffering is voluntary. He is truly the Lamb of God who offers himself freely on the cross out of love for the salvation of the world. The transfiguration is not simply an, simply an event that occurred 2,000 years ago, but it's the paradigm of our faith, of what it means to unite ourselves with Christ, to know him, is not simply to affirm certain ideas about him or to speak certain words about him. To know Christ is to experience him and encounter him as the eternal son of God in the depths of our souls. It is to see him and know him for who he truly is as we share in his life by grace. We enter mystically into the transfiguration when we are transformed by his divine energies and when we shine with his holy light. Then in today's gospel lesson, which you just heard, which usually occurs on the Sunday either before or after the Feast of the Transfiguration, Christ restores the sight of two blind beggars who come out to him as the Jewish Messiah. Have mercy on us, son of David. 
He asked them, do you believe I can do this? And they say to him, yes. Then he touches their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. What an appropriate gospel passage to read in association with the transfiguration. In both accounts, we read of Christ opening the eyes of the blind. Both accounts concern Jewish people who lack a full understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. Both the blind men and the disciples thought of the Messiah as an especially blessed human being, or even perhaps several different heroic human beings, but not as a divine person, not as God himself. Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament law and the prophets, but Christ's superiority to them is revealed when the voice of the Father identifies him not as a prophet, but as his own beloved son. At the end of the vision, only Christ remains. He is not simply the son of David. He is not simply the king. He is not just a prophet. He is light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father. Both today's gospel text and the Feast of the Transfiguration concern people who need healing that is beyond their own power. The three disciples in the feast represent all of us who've turned away from personal union with God. Our sins have darkened, distorted, and clouded the eyes of our souls. Left to our own devices, we would never behold the glory of God. Likewise, spiritually, we all come to Christ like two blind men, calling out for his mercy to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Those men do not have full understanding of who Christ is. But the Savior doesn't require full understanding. He asks only that they believe that that he can help them. The Lord treats Peter, James, and John in a similarly generous way. These disciples do not have a full comprehension of who Christ is until when? Until after his resurrection. Nonetheless, he mercifully reveals his divine glory to them. They have at least enough faith for this vision to be of great spiritual benefit. This experience is life-changing. It's through this experience that they were prepared to receive the further unbelievable good news of the resurrection and to proclaim this good news to the world. He enlightens the disciples at the transfiguration for the healing of their souls, which enables them in turn to enlighten others, us. We all suffer from a badly distorted vision in our relationship with God with other people, and even in relationship with ourselves. Our spiritual vision is weak or non-existent because we become content with the darkness and weakness in our souls. Instead of doing all that we can to grow in the divine lightness in response to the Lord's mercy, we have preferred to stumble around in the night of our sinful passions. As humans, we're often the blind leading the blind who together fall into a pit. The good news is that Christ has become one of us in his infinite mercy so that we may become partakers of the divine nature, so that we can participate personally in the eternal and holy life for which he created us. If we will call out to him in humble faith and repentance, he will restore our spiritual vision as surely as he healed the eyes of those two blind men. All they had to do was to believe and ask and ask and you will receive, the Lord says. And this leads to the, this, this important point this morning. We can be sure that those two blind men are, are not half-hearted when they call out to him. But instead, they're opening the wretchedness of their lives for healing with every ounce of their being. We need to do the same thing regularly, even daily, by cultivating a habit of prayer in which we open our hearts and minds to the Lord for healing and for strength. Prayer is not simply thinking about God. It is being present to him, body and soul. It is true spiritual knowledge of God, not simply having religious ideas or feelings. True prayer is God opening the eyes of our souls to the same divine glory that the disciples saw at the transfiguration. This is how we may become illumined with the gracious divine energies that will penetrate us like radiation, like x-rays. How will our faith in God grow? How will we be saved 
through a direct mystical encounter with the Lord himself. This is what our Christian faith is all about. In conclusion, there's no substitute for seeing God as he reveals himself in his son. There's, there's nothing that compares with that. Everything else is just preliminary. It's, it's, an, it's an adjunct, but to see the glory of God, to see the face of God in Christ, that is the goal. Even as we cannot expect a room to be full of light and to, unless we draw back the shades and uncover the windows, we can't expect the eyes of our souls to be illumined unless we offer ourselves to God. Everyone, everyone has time to pray. We can all offer the Jesus prayer many times during the day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Prayer is how we open our souls to the brilliant light of Christ. Like those two blind men in today's gospel, it is, it, that is how we present ourselves in faith for his healing. Though we may not yet have the eyes to see it, prayer is how we may behold the radiance of the only begotten Son of the Father. Prayer is the most basic practice of the Christian life and absolutely necessary if we want to stop wandering around in the dark. Prayer is how we may be illumined by the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand.